and I remember because I'm not from Vegas so like I went up to the bar and I asked for a whiskey diet and they told me like eight dollars and I was like yeah f right because I was like that's outrageous if you only know? you knew like, if only you knew <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local Las Vegas music scene and the people that make it, including me. I'm Josh, and today my guest is Las Vegas' own self-described emo cowgirl. Her music combines elements of country and western songwriting with the raw energy and angst of emo music to create a unique yet familiar sound. Her upcoming EP, Eberly, is being released one song at a time on DistroKid. Link is in the description. Uh, at the time of recording, one of those songs, Quicksand, it was released January 18th. And the music video for Quicksand released on Monday, January 25th. There will be a review of her uh, EP once it all comes out in March. So if you haven't subscribed already, you know what to do. Do that. And I'll let you know. Without further ado, please welcome to Room 6, Cat Calling. Hi, Cat. Hello. How's it going? Unbelievable. How are you? I'm pretty okay. Thanks for having me uh, do a little, your little interview thing. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, yes. Thank you for coming on my pokey little show. Um, First, congrats on the new EP. Thank you. How, how long did it take you to uh, to get from ideas to actually it's going to go out? Um, well, that depends on which song we look at. Uh, two of the songs are brand new that I wrote in 2019. And one of the songs I've had since 2012 with my old punk band that is mine. It's my baby. But I just re- uh, rearranged it and made it for my uh my ep here so technically we're looking at like a 10 year uh start to finish if you consider the the, the last song on the ep um but if we're looking at just the other two it's been about two years now january to this january so it's been a minute definitely all right i thought this was more of a like i wrote it in quarantine kind of thing but nope cool nope. <laughs> all right well uh, I've noticed a lot of artists are taking the one song at a time, you know, release thing uh, and running with it. And it makes sense. Um, I was wondering where the name Eberly came from. I'm sure you've answered this many times already. Yeah. So um, Eberly is actually the last name of one of my dear friends, Heather and her husband. Joe. Um, they are just two people that, that mean a lot to me. They've done a lot in regard to helping me with the album and like support. Um, I actually met Heather playing Fallout 76 on Xbox Live. She randomly found me in the game. And now we have just a giant group of online, like, best friends um, that, you know, uh, a couple of them have seen me on tour when I played Portland in 2019 in L.A. Uh, it's kind of weird, but it's cool because these are, like, some of the best friends I ever had. And we log on every night at, like, 9 p.m. and just run a raid together. So, yeah, it's dedicated to them because they've just been such, like, militant supporters of me so militant i like that um awesome yeah <laughs> now uh even though you only have uh three songs on spotify right now at, at the time of recording it's obvious you put a lot of effort into the production value of your released songs uh going for quality over quantity approximately how long do, is there like what generally like it takes this long once you have an idea for a song to start building it and then until you're like, okay, when you when is it done? I guess is what I'm really asking. You know, uh, that's I don't know that I have a real answer for that um, because it's so different. Like sometimes, like for example, uh, GFY, which will be on the EP, I wrote in two hours back in 2012, and it's basically not until I rearranged it last year has it even been touched. But it was like done. Um, There's a lot of raw anger there. But then like Quicksand started off as like a really slow, sultry song. And I changed it up like over a year and a half of just like working it. So it really just depends. Um, it, I don't know. I really don't know how my process works at all. And I wish I could tell you, but I have no fucking idea how it works. So your guess is as good as mine. Now, your lyrics have the classic trait of fitting whatever era you're listening to them in. Uh, Minnesota Winners and Mommy Issues uh, in 2018 totally fits right now, but as it did in 2018, um, which comes first usually, lyrics or the music? Um, that's another one I wrote in 2012, by the way, fun fact, um, oh, and I didn't sorry. put it out. 
2016 or 2018, whenever I recorded it, it was, it, that was a grip between that too. Um, but I, um, it's once again, it's random. It's, um, if I have an idea, I'll write it down. Um, I, I really don't have a method. It's just kind of chaotic. And if I can work something, uh, I've tried to sit down and put lyrics and then music, but sometimes it just, it, it's really just whatever. I don't, I, I really wish I had a cooler answer or like, here's my method A to B, but it just doesn't work like that for me. I'm just chaos with how I work. So it's quite all right. I honestly, in the same way, um, but it's nice. To, like, sometimes songwriters will say, oh yeah, I always, I, I always have a, a, a little riff or whatever in mind and I build the song and I build the lyrics off of that. And I've done that. And I've also done where a line gets stuck in your head and it lives rent free in your head until you're like, I have to make a song out of this and get this out of my head. And then you're like, what music would work with that? And so yeah, trust trust me, I'm I'm right there with you. I've written a song in two hours and I've written a song in years. So and, and when you're done with the years one's always I'm never quite happy with the ones I did in the, over the years for some reason. I'm always self-conscious of them. Probably because you're like, did I overthink it or did I take too long? Okay. Singers, what do you do? <laughs> Yeah, I can I can relate to that. I can understand that. Right on. Um, now, you're a big fan of singers like Haley Williams and uh, Leanne Rimes, two powerhouses from seemingly different musical genres. Um, if you had to pick one song or lyric from each of those stars that you feel sums you up perfectly, what would it be? You know, I've never thought about that question before, and that's something that I don't know I have an answer to because I don't typically feel like I relate to a lot of people. Um, and that's I, that, that. That's not meant to sound like uh, not like other girls. Wise, I just I have trouble understanding other people's experience a lot of the time, and that could be the, the being on the spectrum thing. Um, but that's but your question's almost like asking me how to pick a favorite child. Like if I had one, and I don't know that I that I could that I could do that. Um, I can think on that one though, and maybe tweet it out sometime if I find the answer. No worries. I, I that's. It, it just when I, I I read that um you really liked Haley Williams and Leanne Rimes, I was like, hmm. Now they actually write lyrics. <laughs> they actually write like meaningful stuff. So I wonder if there's something there. So I just thought I'd, you know, dig deep a little. Um uh, yeah. no worries. I, I'm kind of the same way as well myself. So um we're in the same boat there. Yeah. Uh, so different tact. Do you feel there's one lyric or song that you've written? that perfectly sums up who you are. Like if someone wants to know who is cat calling, you say play. Yeah. Um, I would say probably an Andy lion. Um, there, there's a line in there that's like, um, I'm full of weeds. I'm not hurting anybody. Um, I just want to be become food for bees and my colors don't necessarily look good on everyone. I'm just kind of waiting for the seasons to change. So it's, um, I would say that really does sum me up in the sense of like, I may be kind of um, a mess sometimes, but I'm not doing, I'm not, I'm trying not to do harm. You know, I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to like go through the, the therapies and getting better with things that I've had to deal with. And, um, you know, and if you don't like me, that's fine. It's like, whatever, that's your fucking thing. I don't, that's none of my business if you don't like me. So I'll find my people with or without that. So it's kind of, that's, I would say that's me. Now, your musical journey has taken you through various places, including punk, which you mentioned in the past. Can you walk us through how going from punk to your current sound happened? Well, I started with my current sound. I, punk wasn't my first uh, venture. I've always just played acoustically. Um, and I've it's just always been kind of the music I listen to. But I joined a punk band for... Um, like, well, fun kind of when I was in college, my first college. And uh, we had a lot of, I had a blast doing it just because it's angsty, fast, you know, it's, it's punk, it's fun to play. Um, but once I got out of that, I just went back to like what I write naturally. But you see that a lot with like a lot of like the emo bands, like their singer comes back to like a solo project and it's way different than the what they were doing before. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Um, now I'd like to, if you don't mind moving to a little bit of uh, more kind of my usual interview questions, but um, basically what would you say was your earliest musical influence? What was that song or that, that genre or that 
person that's made you think, I want to do that? Um, so I was um, a really big fan of a country singer named Chris Ledoux. He's no longer alive, but he was, um, he was actually a Wyoming uh, resident. Uh, but he was pretty famous in the country world, right? But he, um, um, I used to rodeo as a kid and he was all about rodeo and you'd see him, he'd play all the rodeos all the time. Um, and when I would be at a competition or we would go with my father or something, I'd always make him take me to the ones that he was at. Um, he kind of like inspired my, my journey, but I think that, um, I don't know that I actually really have a memory of like this person inspired me because I literally started like singing and performing at the age of like two and three in front of my family. I just kind of like came out this way. There was no influence. I just was. <laughs> so, nice. I just was. Nice. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So from your earliest musical influence, I'd like to talk to you about your current musical influences. What is it that like, when you're, when you need to feel jazzed up or, or I want to start, thinking about making music again what is what are you listening to now that stirs the creative juices so ironically enough when I need to be creative I actually stop listening to music because if I listen to other people I get to um uh I can accidentally just write what they wrote without my own ideas so I literally will just not consume and that might be weird to hear because a lot of people are like oh I was listening to this at the time but I just I have had to just stop because I've been so like wrapped up in type, like uh, it's almost like typecasting yourself where I like um, I needed to kind of develop and harness in like what I wanted to sound like. Um, and so, but if I do listen to something, it'll be like, you, you said jazz and ironically enough, that's what I'll listen to is like, like jazz music or something that's so out of my, like my like radar and stuff that I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to like influence it that hard. So. That's one of the things I love about doing this channel is that aside from interviewing bands and musicians, I also get to review them, their stuff, their live shows, um, or even just they, I'll, I'll ask the question about early musical influences or what are you listening to now? And they'll spout stuff off. I've never heard of, never heard of this stuff. And I'll start going down that rabbit hole. And then I realize, wow, there's another little niche that I hadn't been exposed to or that I like this aspect of it so it's definitely um if you listen to my two albums you can um link is in the description hey uh, if, you, if you listen to my two albums there's a definite change between the first one which i wrote just by myself on an acoustic guitar pining for a girl you know <laughs> and and like that and the album where i have i have one song with seven guitar solos all overlapped each other all boom and it, and it oh. just yeah, I just and I told the the, the engineer who was also uh, my ba who's also my bass player and uh, played the drum kit on the album was like, hey, what if can you play them all? <laughs> just play them all at once. And and I was with a little tweak and it, that that became um, a song called Responsibilities. So I I'm like like you again. It's scary, but I, I I'm definitely the same way when when I need to feel like okay, I'm. I'm, I need to start thinking about me now for a little bit and making some st stuff for me. And I will switch out uh, jazz. I'm actually, uh, uh, I'm learning to drum and jazz. Well, jazz. <laughs> so, you know, uh, any of that, oh, but also um, punk, like various stages of, of punk really. And um, emo, I mean, I, I I try to cast a wide net when it's time to, I need to be a sponge, I need, I need to absorb some stuff, but when it comes time to really be like, okay, let's write some music. What always, what I always do is I grab, can you see, I don't know if you can see in the shot, that acoustic guitar, that that's what, you know, both albums were written on and, and any future stuff is written on acoustic because if it sounds good on acoustic, it'll sound good plugged in. So yeah, right there with you. Moving on, I'd like to talk to you about uh, shows, if you don't mind. What is your favorite show memory? Could be good, could be bad. Um, I think my favorite show memory was actually, I played the Viper Room in 2019 in LA. 
um, with my kind of like good friend, mentor, uh, just peer, Mark Rose from Spitalfield. Um, and he, uh, he's kind of like taking me under and like, let me play a lot of shows with him. But I just remember um, a packed LA bar with him and a lot of my best friends and people were just like really singing uh, some of my songs that they knew and stuff. And I think it was just a lot of fun because not, not obviously it's fun because people liked my stuff and they were doing it, but it was like this energy of like, everyone was just fucked up. We were having a good time. It was like a party energy, but I was the energy bringer. And I think that was a lot of fun to be able to curate mood for that, that little bar there um, in Hollywood. So I think that's, that's my most recent one, but I think if I had to pick another one, um, when I was in attention whore, my old punk band in Minnesota, uh, we played a birthday show for me in Minnesota winter <laughs> in February. And some girl brought a whole ass ice cream cake from Dairy Queen for me. And I didn't ask her to do that. And we all just got drunk and ate a bunch of ice cream cake. And it was awesome. And that's probably my second favorite one. Then the floor collapsed in part of this house we were playing in because it was a fucking punk house in Dinkytown, which is like by the University of Minnesota. So it's like kind of a, it's not frat row, but it's around there. And there's like some like, there's some questionable uh homes in that area <laughs> but wait, yeah. wait 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 you're telling me there's literally a town called dinky town yep so uh then there's minneapolis and then you go to dinky town which is the college area it's right where the u of m is um there's uptown north town like all, all that kind of shit northeast but yeah dinky town is basically the college area for minneapolis Nice. Those definitely are some really good uh, show memories there. I'm I'm jealous. Not yeah. about the fall. Not about the fall through the floor though. I didn't. Just some random dude did, but this still oh, sucks. Okay. <laughs> I've I've had close. Um, you ever played the Cheyenne Saloon when it was a thing? Yeah, actually, I think when I first moved out here, um, that was one of the first places I went to, and I remember because I'm not from Vegas, so like I went up to the bar and I asked for whiskey diet and they told me like eight dollars and i was like you're fucking right because i was like that's outrageous if only you knew (laughs) if only you knew but now that's cheap compared to other places but yeah like i was like nope i was like i getting drunk for 250 back in minnesota i'm like this is a ripoff but yeah i was there and then they changed it to an adrenaline sports lounge or some shit Mm -hmm. actually yes uh and then uh he became the bass player for a band that i just actually recently interviewed words of what words as weapons uh, unfortunately, they decided to part w- ways with him, uh, or he decided to part ways with the band shortly before the interview. But eh, uh, but yeah, I, I played. I actually played um, Cheyenne Saloon. The stage moved under you as you walked. Yeah, like for the the little they had a little proscenium out front, and as the front man, I go to step out there, and I'm like, okay, no, <laughs> let's step back. Uh, and then adrenaline came, and. and uh, Rick, the the guy who owned it and tried to get it, you know, to to, to be a thing, he did something cool. Mount, he had a, a monitors mounted in the floor of the stage, so mm-hmm. the, that was nice, and um, a killer subwoofer. So yeah, he he tried, he tried real hard, but unfortunately, <sighs> Vegas is a little oversaturated sometimes when it comes to that kind of stuff. But uh, it, any bar, any venue that it actually is like cares about the music more than they do the bottom line isn't going to live but a, it's a it's a balancing act and you know it is what it is but uh sorry back back to you <laughs> moving on um so from your favorite show memory i was wondering if we could talk a little bit about gear i now, mean if you want not really i'm a, i'm not really a gear head at all so we can we can but yeah. i don't know shit <laughs> well, the whole point of this interview is to show, show your fans who you are off, off stage, but also give, you know, maybe somebody likes your particular guitar tone or, or you know, your vocals or whatever. I was just wondering when you do, when you, when shows were a thing, <laughs> remember those? Uh, when you have done shows, what, uh, what gear do you rock? Um, I just have a Fender uh, Sonoran guitar, acoustic electric. Um, it's got the like electric headstock on it and it's all black. Um, that's what I play and that's it. So there's my equipment. You got the whole list. Last question. You made it. Yay. Let's pretend you're doing a show. 
<laughs> all right. And I asked this to, I asked this of all my prey. I asked this of all my guests. Um, let's pretend you, you just got done doing a show and some new young musician comes up and says, Cat, how do I sound like you? They ask, you know, what is one thing that you wish someone had told you when you started doing music? Um, it's a tough one. Um, maybe, maybe I wish that someone would tell me that like everybody is stressed out if they're good or not. And like, honestly, if somebody thinks they're too good or they're like, they have an attitude, like fuck that person, it doesn't matter. Also, it doesn't fucking matter. You just need to like do it. it even if it sucks. If it sucks, you have to put it out. You have to write the songs that suck. You have to get through the suck to get to the good stuff. You know what I mean? So I wish that somebody had told me that, like, you are not going to write the perfect draft the first time. It's not going to be it. It's very rare that that happens. And it's fine to edit. And it's fine to fine tune yourself a little bit. It doesn't mean that you're not decent. Seriously, <laughs> that is the best advice I've heard. In a long time from anybody that's I've, I've asked that question to that is awesome and it's true i'm like it's true every single performer unless they're just got their head up their ass is really worried about did i do good am i going to do good uh what you know they're just they're that's what and if, if you ever try to talk to them get them to sign something or whatever and they seem really distant they're probably focused and totally just in their own little world of worrying, right? And and, and making sure that they're, they're going to put out the, the you know what you expect them to. So there's times and places for things. And then there, of course, you do have the people that just don't want to talk to you because you're a local band or whatever. And they're the national act. Looking at you, Iron Butterfly. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to say thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for watching. And please, please make sure you click the link down below so you can, I believe they can uh, pre-order. Uh, is that right? Pre-register to, to get Eberly? Um, So this is the link that you have is, um, if it's the quicksand link, that's just the pre-save for that. But it'll be on um, all Spotify, um, Apple Music. Just, you know, follow the at cat calling on Instagram, all those things. You'll be able to find it. It's not hidden. Cool. Obviously, I'm going to have all her social media down in the doobly-doo. And uh, I want to thank you for watching again. Remember, remember, we're all in this together. Support your local musicians. And uh, if you want to see more videos like this, please click up here. If you want to subscribe to the channel, I'd appreciate it. It does make a difference. Please click down here. Maybe give it a like. But more importantly, remember to follow Kat on the social medias. I follow her on TikTok and she follows me. Hey, uh, in the meantime, have a great day and we'll see you next time in room six. Say bye, cat. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba.